Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Gather and Go, the podcast that helps you plan, promote, and lead better trips. I am Brian Jewell. I am your host, and I am so thankful that you decided to spend some of your time with us today. And as always, our promise to you is that we're going to do everything we can to make that investment of your time worth your while. Now, today, I have a really cool featured conversation for you with Nicole Boyer, the ginger sales ninja. Nicole has been a travel salesperson for a long time and has some really fascinating insights for us about how we can all become better at selling, well, whatever it is that we sell in the travel space. Uh, And specifically, uh, Nicole addresses all of those who maybe aren't uh, the biggest personality in the room, who aren't the natural born salespeople, not extroverts. She has some fantastic tips and insights on how you can still be successful in sales, even if you don't have a huge personality. You are not going to want to miss this conversation. First, though, let's get into some travel news you may have missed. An airline in Argentina will allow customers to resell their tickets. A Buenos Aires-based ultra-low-cost carrier called Flybondi has announced that it will allow customers to resell tickets if they decide not to use them or if the value of the ticket increases over time. The airline began using blockchain technology for ticketing earlier this year, issuing tickets as non-fungible tokens, or NFTs. Now, the company says it will use that underlying technology to allow customers to resell tickets, much like people already resell tickets for concerts or sporting events. Flybondi CEO Mauricio Sana said that customers who bought tickets at low prices would have the opportunity to sell them to other interested travelers as ticket values rise, with the airline making additional revenue in the form of a transaction fee. Now, Flybondi is the first airline to offer ticket reselling, You can be sure, though, that many other airlines around the world are watching this experiment intently and may roll out similar capabilities in the future. Well, now it's time for us to get into our road tip. This is the segment of every episode where we reach into our bag of travel knowledge from decades on the road and give you some tips that we have found to help our trips go better. And we think they will help yours go better, too. You know, I remember my first few years as a travel journalist, I uh, really loved the idea of packing light. I still love the idea of packing light. Uh, But one of the things that I often did to try to accomplish that goal was uh, I would commit to wearing just one pair of shoes for an entire trip. And that would mean uh, if I was flying or driving, however, I was getting somewhere, the shoes that I wore when I boarded the bus or the plane or got in the car to start driving would be the same shoes I wore Throughout the entire trip, at every activity, at every dinner, no matter where we went, I wore the same shoes. Now, as you know, uh, traveling involves all kinds of different activities, and sometimes uh, you need casual shoes, sometimes you need dress shoes, sometimes you need active shoes. Well, I found this pair of shoes that I thought sort of split the difference between all three types. Looking back on it now, uh, they're actually kind of hideous and clunky and chunky, and I'm embarrassed, of course, that I ever wore them. But hey, It was the early 2000s, and uh, everything was ugly. That's beside the point. Uh, I remember a few times where those shoes just did not serve me well. One time specifically, I ended up hang gliding on a trip in Tennessee, and it was the sort of thing where you have to, of course, run and jump to get started on the hang glide, and there I was in uh, my chunky brown uh, casual slash dress shoes. It did not look good. It did not feel good, and I knew after that trip that I needed to come up with a better plan for footwear on the road. So what I decided to do was to start packing a pair of sneakers or running shoes or hiking shoes, trail shoes, whatever was appropriate for what the itinerary was going to entail. I soon found out, though, that packing dirty trail shoes, running shoes, sneakers in with clean clothes was a bad idea uh, and certainly got some clean clothes all messed up because they came too close to those dirty shoes. That's when I decided to start looking for a better solution. And what I found was the shoe pouch. And this is something that I never, ever, ever travel 
without now. It is just what it sounds like. It's a little uh, bag. The one I use is uh, made of nylon and rubber and some similar materials, but there are plenty of different ones out there. It's a little bag that's just big enough to put a pair of shoes in, and it has a lot of benefits. Uh, number one is it keeps your dirty shoes separate from your clean clothes in your suitcase. And the other thing it does is it keeps your shoes in a compact package that makes them easier to pack. Because uh, if you have ever tried to put shoes in a suitcase, you know uh, it's not always easy or convenient to find a place where they don't just take over your entire luggage compartment and rattle around in there and make a mess. Now, I've looked at several kinds over the years. The cheap and dirty way to do this, of course, would just be to use a plastic bag from your grocery store. And that is definitely helpful in a pinch. What you'll find, though, over time, of course, is those bags. Well, they develop holes in them, and that kind of defeats the purpose of trying to keep your dirty shoes separate from your clean clothes. So after a lot of experimentation, I landed on a bag that I really like. It's called the Eagle Creek Shoe Sack. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And No, they're not paying us to say that. And no, we're not making any money from promoting it. I just think it's something that you will find helpful. Uh, Here's how I use it. I put a pair of shoes in there and I kind of arrange them in the pouch sideways the way they would be arranged in a shoe box so that the soles are facing the outsides of the pouch and the, the uppers of the shoes are facing against each other towards the inside of the pouch and, you know, flipped opposite so that it fits in a neat, tight little package. Uh, If you are wondering what that looks like, just open a shoe box, see how the shoes are packed in there. It's the same way. So uh, I keep a pair of sneakers in that bag all the time, even when I'm not traveling, uh, because it's just so convenient to have a grab and go pouch that I can literally grab out of my closet, stuff into the suitcase, and I don't have to think about, wait, which shoes are in here? Do I have the right shoes I need? It is an easy and simple solution. Now, sometimes I want to wear my sneakers on the plane or in the car or something like that, and I actually might want to pack dress shoes. Well, this can be a little bit more complicated because if your dress shoes are a little bit nicer, they're made of a nicer material, uh, you may be a little bit hesitant to pack them in your suitcase where they could get squished and squashed and bent out of shape. I've actually had that happen a time or two and it's kind of a bummer. So here is the solution that I've come up with. You know how when you buy shoes, they are in a shoe box and they're very often stuffed with a piece of cardboard, a plastic form, some tissue paper, something to help them hold their shape in packing. Well, you can do the same thing when you pack your shoes in this shoe pouch. It's really easy. I just take a clean pair of socks, a pair of socks that I'm going to wear on that trip anyway, and stuff it inside the shoe all the way up to the toe. Sometimes I might need to put a couple pairs of socks in there, Uh, but this is really helpful for two reasons. Number one is those socks help the shoes hold their shape so that you don't have to worry about them getting bent out of shape in the suitcase. The other thing it does, of course, is helps you maximize your packing space because those are socks that you're going to use on the trip. They're inside your shoe pouch. And so you can use uh, your suitcase compartment where you normally would have had your socks for something else. And it helps with that goal of traveling light. And this is great because uh, once I started doing this, I have never since found myself on the road without the shoes that I need and I've never messed up clean clothes with dirty shoes again. So save yourself some hassle, buy a shoe pouch for your suitcase. I promise you won't regret it. And that is your road tip of the week. Now, it's just about time for us to get into our featured conversation with Nicole Boyer. Before we do, though, I want to remind you of two things. Number one, you don't need to worry about taking notes because I am taking notes for you. That's right. After this conversation, I'm going to come back uh, to recap some of the most interesting and helpful things that Nicole and I talked about. And I'm also going to include that same recap in the show notes for this episode. And as always, you can find those show notes right in the podcast player you're listening to right now. Or if you're on our website listening, well, these are the notes just below the audio player on your page. And you can find the show notes for all of our past episodes at grouptravelleader.com slash podcast. Now, the second thing I want you to remember is it's really important to stick around to the end of the interview because after the interview and the wrap up, well, I want to talk a little bit more about 
transferable travel purchases and whether it's time for our industry to think about making all travel products transferable. That's going to be the topic of today's hot minute. You won't want to miss it. We'll be right back with Nicole Boyer. All right, everybody. My guest today is a self-proclaimed introvert who somehow found her way into sales success in the very extroverted tourism industry. After more than 15 years as a group sales professional, she started Ginger Sales Ninja, a consulting company that helps other tourism salespeople develop confidence, build relationships, and promote their organizations with authenticity. Nicole Boyer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I am so glad to have you. So glad I was able to coax you out of the <laughs> comfort of, a, of your introverted life to come talk to me for half an hour today. I definitely appreciate that. Uh, I would love for you to tell our listeners how you got into tourism because it probably wasn't like a uh, self-evident path for you, right? Yeah. Uh, well, like many people in the tourism industry, it was kind of by accident. Uh, I think a lot of us kind of get here uh, not on purpose because we don't even really know that it exists in the, yeah. you know, in the depth that it does exist. Uh, yeah. I started my professional career working in higher education. I was working in college admissions, which honestly, at the time, I refused to think of as a sales job for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I did not want to admit that I was a salesperson. Um, and then after about six years of doing that, uh, for a variety of reasons, I started to think about uh, my future and looking for my next step. And so I was kind of looking to change fields at that time. Um, so I was just kind of evaluating life. And growing up, I had a huge interest in theater and music. And even though I didn't decide to initially go into that as a career, I knew there had to be some job in those industries that I could apply my background in business and, and sales to. So I just kind of started Googling, honestly. Mm -hmm. I, I looked at different uh, theaters that I was familiar with and just started looking at their job postings. And eventually I came across group sales manager at American Music Theater in Lancaster. And I really didn't fully understand what that meant or what I would be doing, <laughs> uh, but I applied. Uh, I seemed to meet the qualifications that they were looking for and uh, obviously the rest is, is kind of history. Um, but as I said, it's really hard to understand like the depth of what the tourism industry means. You know, before you get into it, I don't, I don't think anyone knows what they're really getting into. Um, but I'm so glad that I did. And, you know, I've loved it since the day I've started. Yeah, uh, that's amazing. And you're exactly right. I, I don't think I've met more than a handful of people in 20 years no. who intended to get into tourism. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, um, it's an entirely pleasant accident once you find it and you realize Absolutely. it's this huge, robust ecosystem, this great community of people. Yes. So, and, and Lancaster uh, certainly is uh, a very popular destination in the group tour space. Were you already kind of in Central PA or did you relocate for that opportunity? Um, I was a little east of Lancaster. I moved about an hour and a half, uh, but I'm so glad that I, I started my tourism journey in Lancaster because I think that's really helped me uh, become the salesperson that I am. Like we work so well together as an area and I had so much support um, and was just welcomed from the second I came in. So it was, I'm so thankful that that's where I started. Yeah, very cool. All right. So uh, you describe yourself as an introvert. Uh, our industry is extremely extroverted. So, uh, and and honestly, the profile, if you think of the prototypical salesperson anywhere in any industry, most people probably don't picture an introvert. So tell me about how you have sort of found your way in a sales career with uh, maybe a little bit, you know, off the normal um, sort of personality orientation in that way. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I think I, I truly believe that anyone can be successful in sales and we all have, you know, our own skills and strengths that we bring to the table. But for me personally, I think the biggest challenge as an introvert is I often have to just pump myself up for certain things, right? Like mm. for an extrovert, a day of being on the phone and in appointments and sales calls, like that's great. That's a great day, right? But yeah. for me, um, it can be super exhausting and really overwhelming. So it's a lot about just motivating myself, uh, encouraging myself and, and just diving in and telling myself that I can do it. Um, 
And it's also a lot about preparation as well. You know, extroverts are a lot of times comfortable with just winging it, right? Let's mm. just do it. Let's just dive in. Let's just have these conversations. Uh, for me and, and a lot of other introverts, I just feel a lot more comfortable with with preparation. So it, sometimes it's a little bit more work on the front end, but it, it's not necessarily a bad thing in the long game of relationships, right? You know, I, yeah. I don't know that it's necessarily a disadvantage. It's just kind of a different uh, different approach, maybe a little bit more intentional. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, preparation is so powerful. I feel like across the board in many different industries, there are way too many people just kind of winging it yeah. <laughs> when maybe they should have taken an extra 30 minutes yeah. to prepare for that presentation, that sales call, right. uh, that, you know, report that they needed to do that meeting with their boss. Uh, so there's definitely sort of, uh, some secret advantage there. Absolutely. In, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm curious, um, you know, you didn't realize you were in sales or you didn't want to admit to yourself you're in sales when you're in admissions. You took a sales job. What was that first, I don't know, day or week like when you got a stack of leads or a database and you had to start working the phones? I mean, how how did that hit you as someone that didn't come naturally to that? Yeah, I think the worst part was when I started at American Music Theater, my office was like in a cubicle in the center of other people. So it wasn't even that I was making the the phone calls. It was that everybody could hear me making the phone calls, right? It was <laughs> oh, like, <no. laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't just have to do this. I have to do this and have everyone listening to me. So it was a little bit of like a, <gasps> what am I doing? What have I got myself into? But, you know, again, it's just kind of motivating yourself, taking a moment to, to breathe and prepare before you do it. And then, you know, once you start and once you push yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit, it gets easier and easier and easier. Yeah. Does it get easier once you build that muscle of pushing yourself? It does. It does. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's it gets easy, uh, but it certainly mm. gets easier. Uh, and again, those those relationships that you build, you know, in this industry, it's all about relationships. So now it's not uh, you know, it's not cold calling. It's not just calling out of the blue. It's calling uh, a lot of times a friend, you know, uh, that I've mm. built in this industry. So that is certainly helpful and something a little bit unique to this this industry as well. Yeah, absolutely. We are so relational. I yeah. I feel like it took me a solid five years in tourism to get to where I felt like I could go someplace and had friends there because uh, you go to an event, you walk in the room and there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people who seem like they all know each other. They've known each other for years. They're hugging, back slapping. And when you're new, it can feel really intimidating. Like yeah. these people all know each other. I don't know any of them. How do you get over that hump and break the ice and start to build friendships in a room where you don't know a single person? Yeah. Um, for me, I, again, I was pretty lucky starting in Lancaster. You know, there's, there's a big group of us that, that travel to a lot of these shows. So it is oftentimes that I, I know someone there. Um, and really that's all it takes is knowing one person and that one person mm. knows three people and those three people mm. know four people and it just kind of spirals from there. So, um, just introducing yourself to one person can be so helpful and one thing I found is volunteering has been really helpful to expand my network uh, in a lot of ways. If if the trade show or event that you're going to has an opportunity for you to volunteer, do it. Um, volunteer at registration, be a greeter, uh, join a committee. You know, any any way to get your face out there. And I find that it's kind of um, it's structured FaceTime with people. You know, it's not. Uh, forced small talk, which is an introvert's worst nightmare, right? Um, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a little bit more, more structured and gives you a purpose to, to meet people. Uh, so you're kind of getting FaceTime with everyone. You're also meeting other people that are volunteering. So that's been a really great way to expand my network out of that, you know, Lancaster group and meeting people from other areas. And again, those people know more people that they introduce you to when, when they, uh, see you around. So it's just little by little chipping away at it. And, uh, not being afraid to to step up and, and do something different. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Nicole, you talked about how helpful it can be to have that sort of structured time with people at tourism conferences. Uh, at a lot of these events you go to, the times are very structured. You're going to have those set business appointments that could be like, you know, six minutes at a time and uh, you know in advance who you're going to be meeting with. So uh, how do you lean into that preparation skill you talked about earlier to make sure you show up to a six minute appointment 
ready to make the most of that time with that person. Yeah. Yeah. Your trade show really starts long before the trade show, doesn't it? Uh, you really have to do that homework and and preparation before you go in uh, to make that. You, you only have six minutes. You have to make it valuable. You have to make it worth your time and worth your customer's time. So, you know, it's it's knowing who they are, what they need from you and what you can provide for them, what kind of value you can provide for them. So not every conversation is going to be the same. You know, you can't just walk in and be like, I got my generic pitch ready to go. And, and that's what you do for every appointment. Uh, that's not valuable. You know, it might be someone who uh, is an existing customer and maybe it's just checking in on on how their trips have gone recently to your property. Um, maybe it's a brand new customer and you have to start from scratch. It's it's knowing who you're talking to before you go in again. So you can make that short amount of time worth your time. Yeah. Have you found ways to sort of leapfrog from that six minute appointment into a uh, a longer and more in-depth conversation with that person, maybe at the event uh, or later on? Uh, how do you expand beyond the limits of that short appointment? Yeah, and you have to do that, right? I mean, six minutes is is not a lot of time. And these these customers are meeting with so many people. Uh, during that time, it's it's overwhelming for them. You know, it's it's tough to stand out from the crowd during that time. So it's what you do afterwards that's usually going to make the difference. And again, your connection afterwards is going to be different for every person. Um, maybe it is at the event and you you meet up with them at a networking event event and expand on a conversation. But you really just have to to pinpoint what it was from each conversation that stood out that you need to follow up on. And maybe it's I'm planning for trips in three months from now. So three months from now, you follow up and talk about their trips. Maybe it's that they told you their grandson has a baseball game next week uh, that they're really excited to go to. So maybe next week you send them an email and say, hey, how'd your grandson do at his baseball game? Right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always have to be about the sale. It should often be about the relationship and then the sales will come. Mm, that makes so much sense. So uh, after about 15 years in sales, you said, you know what, I've got stuff here to share. Uh, you started this organization called Ginger Sales Ninja. Uh, first, for people that haven't met you, explain uh, what that means. And then let's talk about uh, the impetus for that and what you're doing there. Yes. Well, since you can't see me on this podcast, uh, I do have red hair. Uh, it's a blessing and a curse. It's, uh, you know, you can't hide uh, when you have red hair. So uh, that's where uh, the ginger part came from, obviously. But again, if you ever told me that I would end up in a career in sales, uh, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of sales training that's out there and, and things that I have been to are... I don't know, almost aggressive and, and formulaic, you know, it's, it's just not, um, me, it's not my approach. Um, because this industry, again, like a lot of others is so much about the relationship. So it's more of the soft skills and the nuances that are kind of missing, um, in these education sessions and these, these trainings. So I really just wanted to create something that I would have liked to have, uh, when I started in tourism and, um, despite being an introvert, I've found uh, some pretty good success uh, in the roles that I've been in the industry. And I just want to see others experience the same. So uh, this is what I kind of came up with to help uh, pass it on and, and share. I, I love that so much because uh, you're right. There are hundreds of, you know, chest thumping sales experts running around out there. You know, they want you to pay four ninety nine dollars for their course or to read their book and you see them and they're just like totally hyped up alpha characters, you know, and for 80% of the population, there's no relating to that. No, absolutely not. Yeah. And so uh, I love this approach of saying, hey, I'm a normal person like you. Uh, I've had challenges and I've had to learn just like you have. And now I'm going to share how a real person can do this in a relatable way. So uh, what does it mean to be a sales ninja? Yeah, great question. Uh, so when you think of, you know, a, a ninja, it's someone who trains really hard and is highly skilled so that they can get their jobs done efficiently. 
without too much attention, right? Um, they're they're really, really good at what they do, but they kind of fly under the radar a little bit. So a, a sales ninja to me is, is very similar. You don't have to be the loudest person in the room um, or the center of attention to be successful in sales. Um, you really have to know your stuff, you know, that training behind the scenes, um, and you have to be intentional uh, about your action. So it's it's all about that preparation in advance so that in the moment you can be calm and confident. That is amazing. Uh, the, I, I never thought about that aspect of the job. Uh, you know, usually in pop culture, we think of a ninja as somebody who's really good at something. Uh, but you're absolutely right. They're so good at it because they have trained so much and have prepared so much. Uh, and, and I love that you don't have to be the biggest personality in the room. You don't have to be the center of attention. You just have to be authentic. Uh, and I love that. Uh, I love that as an approach. So talk to me more about authenticity in your approach to sales and how that works for you and how you leverage it. Yeah, it's, it's again, going back to those, you know, those relationships, you know, it's, it's don't, don't do things that are so robotic or formulaic in your communication and your process, you know, um, copy and paste is great. Uh, you know, canned things are great and they have a time and a place. Um, but it's adding those personal touches and, and continually focusing on that relationship. You know, um, you want to be professional, but you also want to show some personality, like, especially in tourism, it's quite literally the business of fun. Uh, so, so we need to communicate like we're in the business of fun, right? Um, you know, in, in any sales job, somebody has to trust you and like you before they buy from you. Mm -hmm. So just, you just have to constantly make sure you're showing your personality and being, being you and not just being a robot looking for the, the sales numbers in the end. Yeah. And whatever you do, don't be that person who walks into a networking event and papers the room with your business cards. <laughs> Out. The worst. <laughs> it's the absolute worst. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so in that uh, cocktail event, uh, the networking event, uh, how should somebody who's brand new uh, go about making those contacts, building those relationships uh, without being that pushy, uh, overbearing, uh, out of touch uh, business card distributor? Yeah. Yeah. You have to think of those events as as a human introduction, you know, not as, you know, not as a, it is a sales opportunity, but don't think of it as a sales opportunity. It's your chance to meet other humans, you know, and then once you meet those humans, then you can build from there and work towards the sale. But I think when you walk into a room thinking like, oh, I have to get this many business cards, or I have to make this many leads or sales, that's when it becomes overwhelming and you feel the pressure. When you walk in thinking, I just want to meet somebody that I like to talk to, or, you know, I just like this girl's outfit. I'm going to go over here and tell her that I like it. It's those little things that are going to help you start to build those relationships. This is a long game. You know, sales isn't uh, a short game. There's no end goal. You know, there's no point where it stops. It's you're in this for the long haul. So build those long lasting relationships and don't necessarily focus on the, the now. Yeah, I love that. Uh, to dig into that a little bit more, uh, let's say you have started a relationship with someone. You've met with them a couple of times in the structured appointments. Uh, you've hung out and had a, a glass of wine or coffee with them. Uh, you don't see any prospects uh, that they are going to sign a contract, uh, bring you business uh, in the next uh, 12 months. Do you keep the relationship going? How long do you continue to invest? Like how, how do you do that calculus? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know that there's a simple answer. Um, you know, I think you have to take, um, the conversations that you've had and, and kind of do some math from there, you know, mm -hmm. um, in tourism, sometimes it does take a couple of years, you know, yeah. sometimes, uh, there's, you know, a company on, uh, you know, in the Midwest that I've been meeting with for, for years, um, that just finally said, we're working on a trip for next year. We want to include you. Um, that's awesome. You know, I played the long game and, and it's, it's coming to fruition, but, um, there are those people that, and maybe it's, it's just a sense, um, that, that you have to start to feel whether they're being genuine or not, you know, yeah. you can be as genuine as you want, but is that person returning it? Because some people will give you lip service and, and just say, Oh yeah, we want to come out. We want to come out. We want to come out, but you know that it's, it's just not the case. So, you know, you never want to necessarily end a relationship, but you have to decide, 
uh, how much effort you really want to put into that relationship. Do you think it's really going to going to bring something? And sometimes it just comes down to flat out asking, you know, um, do you think this is a, ever a realistic option for you? You know, um, and that's not always the easiest thing to just come out and do. But sometimes once you've put so much effort into it, you just need to simply you know, ask the question and say, Hey, you know, is this gonna, is this gonna go anywhere for us? Yeah. Do you find that when you invite people to tell, you no, they maybe are almost relieved and, and you get much straighter answers from them than if you dance around it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause sometimes people are, are just playing, I guess, playing the game or whatever along with you. And, uh, and you're both kind of like, I don't know, is this worth it? Is it not? Uh, and yeah, when you finally just come out and ask, you're both like, okay, cross that one off the list yeah Yeah. and we can still be friends exactly and and maybe maybe we can actually be friends because you know there's not this uh this weird awkward uh, tension between us so I, i like that a lot now you've told me before that you are not a fan of the elevator pitch so explain that because i think a lot of sales professionals are taught you know you always need to have your elevator pitch ready why don't you like it and what do you like better Ugh, I'm definitely not a fan. Um, <laughs> all those words I've thrown around so far, like uh, generic, formulaic, forced, um, that to me describes an elevator pitch. It's awful. Um, no one wants your canned commercial when they meet you. Um, again, every interaction that we have is different. Every person that we meet is different. So, you know, let's say you really are in an elevator, the whole concept of this thing. And let's say you you work for a hotel, right? Um, Maybe there's a family that comes in with kids uh, and they ask you what you do. So you respond with where you work and you highlight your distance to a nearby water park. Um, Maybe you're in an elevator with a guy in a business suit. So you can talk about that same hotel, but maybe you talk about the volume of of corporate events that you get at your hotel. You know, everyone is different. So speak to them uniquely. Um, Just be authentic, be genuine. Um, Elevator pitches are usually full of like, pretty marketing words. And that's great for a website. It's great for a business card. It's just not stuff we say out of our mouth uh, on a regular basis. (laughs) And it just sounds awkward, right? So again, if you're prepared and you know your stuff, that's great, but don't be rehearsed. Like don't be so forced and rehearsed. It just has to come across as real and as you. Yeah, absolutely. I would even add that like if, if you stumble over your words a little bit, nobody cares. It just makes you seem more human. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like a, a perfect presentation sounds inhuman. That's gross. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So a lot of our listeners are the kind of people that sit across the table from you at events. Uh, they are tour operators. They're group leaders. Can you think of some things that you have picked up in sales that may help them when they are back home uh, talking to their prospective customers people that they're trying to convince to come on one of their trips to, to give them a shot. What translates from your world maybe into theirs? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's certainly a lot of similarities. And I think, you know, the biggest of which is just focusing on the customer and not the sale. Mm -hmm. Um, One of my favorite quotes is you don't close a sale, you open a relationship. Um, And that's true for, for any person in sales and certainly someone on that side of the table. Um, Again, not everything should be that form letter, that copy, copy and paste. So whenever you can add, you know, personal touches, it's it's super helpful. Maybe somebody's um, looking to book a trip and it's your favorite trip that you have in, in your catalog. Tell them that and tell them why, you know, um, maybe it's a trip that you haven't been on yet, but it's it's on your bucket list. Tell them that <laughs> and, you know, ask them to see their pictures when they get back and then follow up afterwards and, and ask them to share, you know, it, it just goes back to that personalizing where possible, knowing your customer, um, and building that relationship. Everybody wants to feel important. Everybody wants to feel like, um, they're your friend, uh, you know, so, so just stop with the, the copy and paste, um, use it, you know, sometimes, uh, cause it's super helpful and, yeah. and make this more efficient, but make sure you're constantly flourishing and, and throwing in those personal touches. Yeah. Uh, that's great. I love that. Now, uh, you post a lot of pretty great content on LinkedIn. I love uh, following you there. I'm curious if you have some ideas about how people specifically in tourism can use that platform in effective ways, because a lot of the other people I follow 
are either they just don't do anything or their posts are, are kind of forgettable. So what's your approach to making that interesting and effective? Yeah. Um, first of all, for me, it, it has to be really intentional because I am not a big social media person in general. Um, it's just not something that I'm like constantly on. So it's, it has to be really intentional. I actually put LinkedIn as a task on my calendar, um, you know, probably twice a week. I like to post one to three times a week. Um, but it's, it's not, um, again, it's focusing on the relationship and not the sales. So it's not constant sales posts. Here's what we have Buy this, buy this, you know, book this it's, um, sometimes it's just what's going on in my day. You know, it could be something that's frustrating me, um, and how I dealt with it. It could be something that's making me really happy. And uh, I hope maybe it makes other people happy too. And I want to share it. Um, you know, sometimes it's something that I read or saw and I just want to share with people. So it doesn't, uh, I don't think you have to overthink it. Um, I think that's maybe the problem that a lot of people have is is overthinking it. And uh, what can I say? Well, I have to sell something and do this. No, what's going on in your day? Share it, tell people. Um, it's just another way to, to build that relationship and stay top of mind with people. Do you find that, uh, those posts ever create a talking point or a connection point? Uh, like when you do meet somebody, they say, Oh, I remember seeing you say that. And it triggered this thought or this memory for me. Like, does it, does it open doors for you? It does actually. Um, and I, I almost felt a little weird about it when it first started happening, I would go to, uh, trade shows. And somebody that I hadn't talked to in years would be like, oh, I love following you on LinkedIn. You posted this thing the other day. And I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, now it's it, it's been great. And it has, um, again, it, it keeps you top of mind and keeps you connected with people that you may not be talking to on a regular basis. But when they, you know, need something in your area or are, are thinking of, of someone, you know, you're going to be right there um, high on the list. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So for listeners that would love to connect with you, learn more about you or what you're doing, give them an overview of where they can find you and uh, some of the ways that you might be able to help them. Absolutely. Um, well, let's start with LinkedIn since we were just talking about that. Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn is a great way to connect with me. Um, and you can find me at LinkedIn um, slash Ginger Sales Ninja. And uh, I will say, Include a note with your connection request. Um, I think you mentioned earlier, don't go in and paper business cards at a networking event. Yeah. Um, if you send a request without uh, a note, that's basically like throwing your business card at me and walking away. So yeah. awkward. So include a note that says, hey, I listened to this podcast. I'd love to stay connected. And that's awesome. I will do that. Yeah. Um, and then my website, gingersalesninja.com uh, has all sorts of great stuff. Uh, on there. I uh, do speak at some conferences and I offer training as well. And I customize that training. So, you know, if somebody's looking for help with just general sales competence, great. If somebody wants more strategic uh, communications plan and getting ready for a trade show, that sort of thing, I can do that. So we'll kind of start from scratch and, uh, and customize that training for what uh, suits your needs. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Uh, that's fantastic. I hope people connect with you and take advantage of all of that. Now, uh, before we let you go, we have some questions we ask everybody and these are just for fun. So no pressure, uh, off the top of your head, uh, when you book travel, are you booking a window seat or an aisle seat window? Yeah. Just for the view. Absolutely. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, what's one thing in your carry on you wouldn't travel without drama mean. <laughs> 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 oh, you're like my wife. Yeah. That, uh, that motion sickness is no joke. Okay. So if you had a free airline pass in a week with nothing else to do, where would you be headed next? Ooh. Oh man, that's really tough. Um, and it probably changes every time you ask me, um, right now I would say Scotland. Very nice. Have you been there? Um, I have, I was just there in May and I want to repeat the exact same trip all over again. Oh, uh, my husband and I hiked a 96 mile trail and it was the uh, most relaxing vacation I've ever been on. And <laughs> there are a lot of people out there saying 96 miles does not sound relaxing. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, that is amazing. Scotland is uh, gorgeous for sure. So the last question is, uh, what's something you have seen or done on the road that you wish you could go back and experience again with somebody you love? Oh, um, 
Also a great question. Um, I'm so, it's almost like I've been so many places that it's hard to come up with one. Um, I don't know, but I feel like every trade show, there's there's always things I want to go back to. And there's things I have gone back to, which is really, um, which is really fun. Uh, I'll give you an example since I can't think of a new one. Um, there's the Peaks of Otter Lodge in Virginia. Um, and there's three mountain peaks nearby that you can hike. We did that on a fam tour uh, years ago. And a few years, a few years later, uh, my husband and I went down and we stayed at the lodge and did all the peaks and did the winery. And yeah, so this industry is so great because you're constantly getting new ideas of, of uh, vacations and getaways. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Well, Nicole, it's been a pleasure to have you and we sure appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nicole Boyer as much as I did. You know, I really appreciate Nicole's honesty and transparency and her authentic take on the sales world. It is such a refreshing change of pace from the normal hype that we get in the sales industry. I'm really grateful to her for coming on and sharing her perspective. And there are a few things I want to make sure you don't miss. So we're going to go back and hit them again. You know, when Nicole and I were talking about what it takes to succeed in sales. If you are an introvert, she said this, she said, it's a lot about just motivating myself, encouraging myself and telling myself I can do it. It's also a lot about preparation. Extroverts can be comfortable with just winging it. But for me and other introverts, I feel more comfortable with preparation. Sometimes it's a little more work on the front end, but it's not a bad thing in the long term. Boy, I really agree with that. You know, I think Nicole is right about the value of preparation really in almost any sphere of life. It's easy to look at people who come by things naturally and think, oh man, that must be easy. But in the long term, the people that study and prepare and work in advance are the people who are going to get further. And so preparing for uh, those sales meetings, preparing for events you go to, that is going to make you a stronger and more successful professional in the long run. Now, when we were talking about what it means to be a sales ninja, Nicole said, a ninja is someone who trains really hard so they can get their jobs done efficiently without too much attention. You don't have to be the loudest person in the room or the center of attention to be successful in sales. You really have to know your stuff and be intentional about your actions. It's all about that preparation in advance so that in the moment you can be calm and confident. Boy, what an important thing that is being calm and confident. If you've ever been in an interaction with a salesperson who is nervous, a salesperson who smacks of desperation, a salesperson uh, who doesn't have confidence in themselves, well, it's just about the most awkward thing you can live through. And it doesn't make you want to do business with that person. So Nicole is absolutely right. If you can get yourself so well-trained that you can go into that sales interaction with calm and with confidence, it's going to make it a lot more enjoyable and it's going to make you a lot more effective. Now, finally, when we were talking about the importance of authenticity, Nicole said, don't do things that are formulaic and robotic in your sales process. She said it's about adding those personal touches and continually focusing on that relationship. Tourism is quite literally the business of fun. So we need to communicate that we're in the business of fun. So you have to show your personality and be yourself. Now, that's one of the things I love so much about tourism is that it is the business of fun. And I have long believed that we're a little bit too stuffy at uh, trade shows and conferences and places like this where people are trying very hard to look professional and businessy, well, maybe it's okay to let that go. Maybe it's okay uh, to let your hair down, to dress a little crazy, to do something that makes you feel fun and confident because here's the great thing that's going to happen. The more fun that you seem, the more you're going to attract travel planners who want to join you in that fun. So be yourself. Don't be robotic. Have a good time and you are going to do better and better as a travel salesperson. Great stuff there from Nicole Boyer. 
Well, we talked in our industry news segment about one airline in Argentina that is giving its customers the ability to resell their tickets. In fact, that airline also gives its customers the ability to transfer, rename, give away those tickets. And it got me thinking, why aren't all travel purchases transferable? That is the topic of today's Hot Minute. Yeah, that's right. The Hot Minute is the portion of the show where I take 60 seconds to give you my unfiltered views on an issue that impacts tourism every day. And today we're going to talk all about those nagging change fees and cancellation policies. So let's put 60 seconds on the clock and get into it. All right. I am not a gambler, but every time I book a trip, I am making a bet that nothing will force me to change or cancel those travel plans. And if something goes wrong, it could end up costing me big time. You know, airlines take billions of dollars in change fees from customers who have made that same bet and lost, but they're not the only ones cashing in. Increasingly, hotels are selling non-refundable room nights, and uh, some cruise lines and tour companies are using this tactic too. Now, I've never thought change fees and no cancellation policies were good customer service, but I could understand the business argument for them. Now, though, with the blockchain and other technology making ticket transfers literally cost-free for travel vendors, the choice to keep strict policies and fees in place is becoming indefensible. Because cancellation policies and change fees are really just a sneaky form of legalized gambling. And in the end, the house always wins. Well, that's the hot minute. That's how I see things anyway. Of course, as always, you are welcome to disagree with me. And we can still be friends. And hey, whether you agree, disagree, or have other thoughts or questions, we would love to hear from you. You can reach us at podcast at grouptravelleader.com. I read every email that comes into that address. I really enjoy hearing what you think of the show and what you think of everything going on in travel today. And hey, you never know. Your thoughts or questions might just be the topic of the next hot minute. And hey, while you're in the mood to give us some feedback, would you do me a favor? Would you go to your favorite podcast player? And if you haven't already followed or subscribed to the show, hit that follow button right now so that you'll get the next episode automatically when it comes out in a couple of weeks. And while you're there, give us a rating, leave us a review. That is super helpful. And I am thankful to all of you who have done that so far. My thanks as well to Nicole Boyer for joining us today. On the next episode of Gather and Go, I'm going to bring you a great conversation with Ursula Petula Barzi, who's going to tell us all about how we can use content to promote travel better. Until then, though, remember this. At the end of the day, we're all on this trip together. So let's make it a good one. See you next time on Gather and Go. Gather and Go is hosted and executive produced by me, Brian Jewell. Our publisher is Mac Lacey. Tanya Simmons is our creative director. Ashley Ricks is our circulation manager and graphic designer. Our sales team is Kyle Anderson and Bryce Wilson. To advertise on the podcast, call Kyle or Bryce at 859-253-0455. Gather and Go is a production of the Group Travel Leader. For more information on our podcast, magazines, and events, visit us online at grouptravelleader.com. Hold up. 